The following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. Remember this, when you're the greatest fighter in the world today, they got a name for you. They don't call you a great fighter, they call you Chael Sonnen. Beat me, if you can. And after tonight, none of you in this ring will ever You're talking to the Rolex wearing, diamond ring wearing, kid stealing, woo, wheeling, dealing, limousine right, jet flying, son of a gun, and I'm having a hard time holding these alligators down. Woo! I'm gonna drink a Coors Light. That's a Coors Light because Bud Light won't pay me nothing. And I have in my cold beer. You have your cold beer? If not, you are fucking jabroni. Wash it down with one beer, two beers, three beers, a shot of whiskey. You become a motherfucker. The following announcement has been paid for by the New World Order. Welcome to the Filthy FRB Show for Wednesday, January 28th. I'm FRB and I'm joined by UFC enhancement talent, Filthy Tom Lawler. What's up, man? Not too much. Just uh, here in Vegas. Um, about to whip out my Where's Waldo book to see if it'll help me get the jump on wherever Nick Diaz is. So <laughs> where do you think he is? Is he hiding out in Stockton or is he like somewhere – in Vegas, and this is all one big, you know, publicity stunt. That's a very interesting question. Um, personally, based on the fact that his bags arrived in Vegas, or that's the report that we've been given, uh, I think it's very likely that he's in Vegas and did not check in with the UFC. Uh, I know from my own personal experiences, you can get to the airport, you can arrive uh, during fight week. And then you could probably just not go to the baggage claim and uh, go somewhere else in Las Vegas. And perhaps that's the case. The last two times I've run into Nick Diaz in person, we're both at the Mandalay Bay um, at the Light Night Club and I believe Daylight uh, Beach Club. So uh, he could be at either one of those locations. So, But if we go back to UFC 158 in Montreal, he no-showed the open workout at that event, and that was right before the George St. Pierre fight, which, uh, you know, one of the, the top selling pay per views they've done made him a ton of money. One of the main reasons why he can afford to fight every two years. So he has a history of skipping these things. So it, it's nothing too crazy. But I wonder here's my conspiracy that he went to the airport and he knew UFC was going to show up with their embedded crew. So he, br- he brought along a decoy bag full of gear or it could have just been full of magazines or, or or anything and he was basically trolling the ufc and maybe he was maybe he's still in stockton and i don't know yeah i, I guess uh i guess we'll find out soon enough um personally i think it's great <laughs> so uh the guy is like such a character uh stuff like this adds so much to his persona and like the aura around this fight that to me it didn't have before because Nick Diaz hasn't done a lot of his normal promotional tactics, trash talking his opponents. Um, you know, it seems like he's been in the gym training. Uh, it's been well publicized. He's been training with Artem Levin, uh, Joe Schilling and uh, Chidi Njikwani. And so he's brought in great kickboxers and it sounds like he's been in the gym busting his ass and uh, you know, the the allure was kind of missing to this fight in a way from Nick Diaz's side, but uh, it's good to see him back. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned Joe Schilling, and I saw on Twitter he put out a tweet. Uh, he's doing some media, I guess, for his Glory fight. I don't. It might be February six. I'm not positive on that. But uh, he was like, if you ask me about where Nick Diaz is again, 
it's and he didn't have to finish it. I think it was like he was just going to hang up on them because that, that's all he was getting. Because uh, you know, it's it his buddy, I guess. Yeah, uh, he's kind of like uh, you know, in a way, he's like the Marshawn Lynch of MMA at this point. It uh, doesn't seem like Nick Diaz wants to do a whole lot of media. Doesn't want to cooperate with the UFC. Um, we'll see. I mean, they must have more press uh, and media appearances coming up for him. We'll see if he shows up for those. Well, I mean, if you go back to UFC 158, he did show up for the press conference, not the open workout. So I think this is the, the press conference is the one they can probably fine him a ton of money, like maybe a six figure fine for not coming to the press conference. Yeah. And uh, Nick Diaz seems like, you know, he's pretty interested in money. So uh, I expect him to be at the press conference. I think this. Uh, him missing the flights has added a lot to the fight, and um, you know I'm really excited for this Saturday. But you mentioned something before about the, there seems to be something missing with this fight, and I don't know if it's a hangover from the whole John Jones, Daniel Cormier thing, and then all the Conor McGregor mania. I, I'm not feeling uh, you know people that are looking forward to this as much as they should. This is Anderson Silva, argu- arguably the the greatest guy to ever do this. Coming back after a horrific injury against a guy who has this, you know, this cult following who is just so interesting because he obviously just doesn't give a shit about anything. What do you think was missing, you know, before this whole fiasco today? Uh, well, I think one thing is that a lot of people really aren't giving Nick Diaz much of a chance. Um, you know, he's a heavy, heavy underdog in this fight. But you've got to remember, Anderson Silva is older. Um, he's coming off, you know, a horrific injury and two losses in a lo- in a row. And uh, you know, Nick Diaz is always dangerous. I mean, no doubt about it. Uh, he can he can take a beating. He can dish it out. He can come back from adversity and win fights. He can hit submissions. He he can do. Um, you know, he can run the gamut as far as skills go in mixed martial arts. And um, I, I think people are just discounting him. And I really do think that he does, you know, out of all the people that fight, he probably respects Anderson Silva more than he's respected any of his other opponents. That's true. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen him or, or heard him say anything negative towards Anderson. I kind of expected that because it seemed like this was a fight that, that he was gunning for. And I, I think the, the first guy who actually put this out there was his buddy Lazy the Savage. And uh, I, I knew, knowing their relationship, that he didn't put that out there you know, just for, you know, just to put something out there to talk about, you know, it was like, he'd been gunning for this Anderson fight. Like he wanted to, to grace the octagon with him. And there was only a couple guys that could, that could get him out of retirement. One of them being Anderson and uh, possibly the other one being a rematch with uh, GSP. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a great, um, it's a great fight. I mean, <laughs> it's going to be very interesting to see what happens on Saturday. Um, you know, it's going to go uh, one of two ways, you know, it's going to be a blowout or it's going to be a, uh, competitive fight. Obviously those are the two, the two most, uh, common occurrences. Um, but it, it's going to be great to see Anderson come back from that injury against Chris Weidman. Um, and you know, see if he can regain his top form or not. Now I'm, I'm under the assumption that Anderson's going to take care of Diaz. I mean, Diaz, he's kind of slow. He's a volume puncher. He's not... Even though Anderson's chin is questionable, and it, there's not very not much precedent for guys in their mid to late thirties who get their jaws crushed to come back and regain that ability to take a punch. You take you take a look at Roy Jones Jr. You look at um, at Chuck Liddell, and it, it seems like once you get past a certain age, once that chin is compromised, it's compromised forever. It's not like getting knocked out when you're. When remember Nick Diaz got knocked out against a guy that got sent to jail, um, you know maybe twelve years ago, and yeah. he hasn't been knocked out since. I, I think you can recoup, but then try try to recoup when you're thirty eight. You know more about it than me as, as a, you know, a guy that stepped in the in the cage many times. Yeah, do you think there's something to that? Uh, for sure, there's something to that. I'm not sure if Anderson is one of those fighters who has you know taken a lot of damage in fights. Up to this point, because I mean, realistically, you were talking about the the knockout against Chris Weidman, where he was clowning around. Uh, 
Now, a lot of people discount that punch, but I mean, it was right on the button. It was perfectly on the chin. Um, the thing I guess that I, I'm not 100% sure of is to me, it looks like, and this is looking at the videos of Anderson sparring. Uh, he does, he still does a lot of the, you know, head down, bobbing and weaving hands, hands down by his waist movement. And, you know, you can get away with that when you're training and you have the headgear on, but I mean, you're still getting hit and those are, uh, unprotected blows. He also is coming from, I mean, I'm not sure if this is where he started, but he was training at shoot a box for a long time. And, uh, you know, the beating that those guys put on each other in training is legendary at this point. And there's no telling how much damage he took there. And, you know, maybe that one knockout against Weidman is, is all it takes and his chin's gone. But, but I, there's no way to tell, uh, until this Saturday. But, you know, Tom, in the second fight against Wyman, in that first round, I, I can't remember the sequence exactly, but Anderson was on his back, and Weidman threw a big right hand, and you could see Anderson's eyes roll to the, to the back of his head and see the back of his head go off the, go off the canvas because, you know, Anderson has this legendary chin where he'll almost just let you punch him, but it was like Chris hit him a lot harder than he thought, and you could see his eyes go... And I thought for a second he had knocked him out again. I think that was in the first round. Yeah, he also – Weidman knocked him down in the first round, if you remember, from inside the clinch. Uh, I believe he hit him with like an uppercut um, and kind of a collar tie and dropped Anderson down to a knee and then ended up on top of him. So th- that could be indicative of you know perhaps his chin is gone. Um, and you know he is older, so you, you just don't recover as quickly. Um, there's, there are a lot of things going in Nick Diaz's favor. Uh, I think the age plays a factor. I think, uh, Nick's personal motivation could play a factor because it seems like, you know, based on the interviews that, uh, we've seen with Joe Schilling and, and the information that we've been given that he's busting his ass in training. So I think a lot of people are just counting him out when they shouldn't be. Um, and as the fight gets closer, I think guys, people will be more excited for the fight. You know, I think they'll be, they'll be, uh, a large number of people that maybe were on the fence and will order it come Saturday as opposed to uh, missing it. Absolutely. I mean, there's something really magical about an Anderson Silva fight. And, you know, I know that because I've, I've been to a, a lot of them, especially, you know, being around Chael during his two fights. There's, there's this, uh, this magic to Anderson Silva and, you know, the, the 50 people that he has around him at the hotels and they're all wearing the same sneakers, the same uniform, I mean, nobody has an entourage like this guy, but just to switch gears, you mentioned, you know, Anderson getting a little older. Well, Dan Henderson's like seven years older or, or six <laughs> years older than Anderson Silva. And I, if I'm not mistaken, you've trained with Dan in the past and he's coming off a, uh, uh, a stoppage loss to Gegard Musasi last Saturday. And there's a lot of people that want him to retire. So what do you think, uh, about the situation with Dan losing five out of six? Well, per- personally, um, and I'm a, you know, I'm a huge Dan Henderson fan. Uh, if I had my choice, I would probably rather see him retire at this point. Um, it's one of those things where if he would have stopped even a few fights before, a few fights ago, you know, I think he'd be looked at in a greater light uh, down the road in history. Uh, I think you know you're gonna people are gonna look back on his record and see these recent losses and kind of um, discount how, what a high level he was at at one point. You know, uh, he won the Rings King of Kings tournament back in the day. Um, you know, former two time or uh, two weight class title holder in Pride. So he's done pretty much everything you can do, and uh, I just don't think that he has anything to prove at this point, and they should step away. Yeah, I mean. From what I understand, there's absolutely no possibility of Dan retiring. I, you know, as it came out, you know, a while ago, he he got remarried, and you know, when when you break up a previous marriage, and and you're a really rich, and you're a male, and you're you live in California, there's a lot of financial responsibilities that come with that divorce, and uh, throw in a, a couple kids. And uh, despite all the money he's made, I mean, he made $3 million in one year from Strike Force. He, he doesn't want to walk away from a competition point of view. And I don't think he wants to walk away from a monetary point of view. 
uh, well, <laughs> after being on his compound before, uh, I would think that he's doing okay financially, but, uh, you know, I'm not privy to his bank statements, so I can't tell you one way or another, but, uh, you know, I, th- I think he's doing pretty well. I think it's more the fact that, you know, he just doesn't know anything else at this point. He's been competing his whole life and he's been competing at a pretty damn high level the entire time. And it's tough, you know, um, people have talked in the past about like post-competition, what is it, post-competition stress disorder? Right? Oh, yeah. Is that- uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome? No, no, no. Like uh, when athletes are done competing, they oh. yearn, like they're missing the, the act of competing. They're missing the limelight. Sure. Uh, and, you know, that may be it. That may be the case with Dan, although he doesn't seem like a guy that's really motivated by external factors like uh, big time fanfare and a lot of attention. Uh, but he's been competing his whole life, and my guess is, you know, that's what he loves to do. And uh, damn it, he wants to do it, Brian. You know, I mean, my understanding is, you know, like I said, he will not retire. And if I'm the UFC, I say to him, we're, we're going to let you go. You've lost five out of six. You, you really can't beat anybody in this, uh, on the roster at 205. We're going to let you out of, out of your contract contingent upon not going to Bellator. You can go to 1FC. You just can't go to Bellator. I wonder if they'll offer him that. Uh, my guess would be no. Well, perhaps, but it, it, that's an interesting thing. Like, I, I think Dan would really take that maybe – I'm not sure if he'd take that in an insulting way or, or how it would be taken. Um, he does have the option of going to Bellator, I'm sure, due to his relationship with Scott Coker and uh, how well they treated him in Strike Force. But is that something that he wants to do? You know, um, I think he wants to be fighting the best guys in the world. Uh, I could be wrong at this point, um, but we'll see. Yeah. And, you know, it, it's just, uh, it's not just the results that are really telling about Dan at this point. It's also like you see him in the cage and he's just moving so slow. Like even that Shogun fight where, where he came back, it, that first like seven or eight minutes, you were like, oh man, this, this guy's lost it. He, he just, he doesn't have it anymore. But, you know, he, he did have that one, that one big punch. And I'm wondering if he has four or four four or five fights left in him, you know, if he can go beat up some guys in Bellator or 1FC. But if you look at the guys that he's fought in the UFC, I mean, every one of those guys are killers. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't know who he can beat that, that's got any sort of name. Yeah, it is tough to find somebody to match up with him. I guess if you were trying to promote somebody um, and you saw a lot of potential in somebody that the fans didn't, then you could give them a matchup with Dan if you think he's on the way out. Um, as far as like a fit goes for him fighting, I think Bellator would be, uh, you know, I think it would be a good fit because it seems like they're moving in the way of promoting attractions. Um, they can put him, Dan on free TV and it'll probably bring some viewers in. Uh, and you know, he'll fight guys who are at the top of the division of Bellator, but you know, unfortunately for Bellator, those guys aren't John Jones. They're not Daniel Cormier. They're not some of these guys at 205 or, at 185, like Musasi, um, you know, Mashida, those type of fighters, uh, you know, there are very, very tough guys in Bellator, but they're not the level of those guys that Dan's been fighting. Yeah, you, you bring up Bellator, and uh, I don't know what article it was, but uh, uh, Kevin Kay, the uh, president of Spike TV, came out and publicly said that, that Scott Coker has been talking to Brock Lesnar and Gina Carano. Uh, I find it very difficult to believe he's been talking to Brock Lesnar. And maybe he has. I, I don't know. I, I just, Brock just doesn't seem like the guy who just picks up a phone call. But I, I, guess, I guess when somebody's offering you a boatload of money, I would just think you'd go through his lawyer. Um, and then Carano, I mean, I, I, I thought it was a, for sure she was coming back to the UFC – and then she got a couple of movie parts, and that just kind of fell apart. Yeah, Gina Carano, you know, she'll never be able to make 135. I can't, I can never imagine that. So I'm not sure what the plans were with um, Gina versus Ronda. Um, you know, I know the UFC was pushing for it. They talked about it in the media, and it's a fight that I'd be interested to see. But they would have had to do it at a catchweight. I'm assuming. 
Uh, in Bellator, you know, there's a 145 women's division that they've been um, pumping up. So it, it would be a good fit for her there. She already has a relationship uh, with Coker, so that may, you know, work in her advantage. Um, then, as far as Brock Lesnar goes, maybe Kevin Kay was on the phone with uh, Paul Heyman <laughs> instead of Brock Lesnar. You know, I'm not, I'm not sure what kind of phone service they have up in Saskatchewan. In the middle of the winter, so you mean the um, advocate for the reigning, defending WWE World Champion, that Paul Heyman? I'm sorry. <laughs> Are you referring to the advocate for the reigning, defending WWE Champion, that Paul Heyman? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, that Paul Heyman. And, and for those of you uh, who listen that have not been around at Fight Week uh, with the UFC when Brock Lesnar was there, Paul Heyman's there. Yeah. I mean, Paul Heyman is with him walking around. I mean, there, that's uh, that's not a gimmick. That's legit. Um, so maybe Kevin Kay was talking to him, you know? Yeah, that's true. You know, I, I only saw Brock Lesnar, you know, just walking around the hotel once out of all the – and I think I went to every one of Lesnar's fights except the one against Overeem. And it was UFC 81. It was in 2008. It was headlined by Big Nog and Tim Sylvia. And Brock was just walking around Mandalay Bay with Rena Mero, or a.k.a. Sable. And usually everybody just, you know, they see the fighters, they want the pictures or the autographs or whatever. Nobody would walk up to Brock Lesnar. I mean, he's, he's that intimidating that, like, even these fans who, who camp out, you know, for pictures just wouldn't even approach him. And he was just, he was just walking around just, you know, like a regular guy, except, you know, he's... 6'2", 290 pounds of, uh, uh, you know, carved out of granite. Yeah. I, re- I remember at UFC 100 um, in the locker room, Seth Pedrozelli took one of the posters that they had given us for fight week uh, because the fighters get, a, you know, a few posters if we want them. Sure. And uh, he was going throughout the locker rooms and having everybody sign them but would not go to Brock Lesnar's locker room. <laughs> he a- absolutely refused to go to the locker room. Yeah, he's he's just not not the type of guy that that you would approach. But uh, speaking of Brock Lesnar, he is going to work with the 2015 Royal Rumble winner Roman Reigns, who basically you know he got booed out of the building with perhaps the greatest performer, the greatest promo maybe there's ever been in this business. The Rock, his cousin, right next to him, gets booed out of the building after winning the Royal Rumble. What were your thoughts? Oh, I loved it. Let me tell you. Uh, <laughs> if, if I subscribed to the WWE Network, then I probably would have been really pissed and uh, canceled it. But I already did that last year after John Cena won the title and the money in the bank. So uh, I, I can no longer even cancel my subscription. Uh, but I was fortunate enough to catch the pay-per-view and you know, see the crowd react the way that they did. WWE had to know going in that was going to happen. Um, you know, they tried to get Daniel Bryan in, get him out early. Uh, and really, they kind of used the guy that doesn't get booed too much with Bray Wyatt to do it. Uh, but, you know, nothing that they did could mitigate the the damage that was done. Um, you know, seeing The Rock in there raising Roman, Roman Reigns' hand and, you know, glancing towards the crowd, it seemed like he was having a tough time um, accepting the fact that he was getting booed by the Philly crowd. So, you know, it's going to be interesting to see based on the fact that the WWE Raw show was canceled this past uh, week due to the snowstorm in, in the Northeast. It'll be interesting to see how the crowd reacts to Roman Reigns on Thursday and then again on Raw Monday. Yeah, so yeah. we're looking at the WrestleMania lineup and we got Triple H versus Sting, John Cena versus Rusev. They're talking about Daniel Bryan versus Dolph Ziggler, and what what am I forgetting? Uh, I'm sure something with the Usos, um, something with the Divas, and uh, uh, Seth Rollins versus Randy Orton. Yeah, that's that's it. Because I I think they were they were thinking about I, Meltzer was writing about this. I I think they were going in the direction Daniel Bryan and Seth Rollins, but they want to do. Yeah, Rollins is um, – what the hell is he doing? I just drew a blank. 
Well, right now he's not doing anything. He he was in that feud with Lesnar and uh, and Cena, but it seems like he's going to be wide open at the moment. Uh, as far as match quality goes, maybe him versus Daniel Bryan would be the best thing for WrestleMania because those guys would go out there and damn near kill themselves um, for our enjoyment, I may add. But uh, I don't know. It doesn't seem like Seth Rollins has much of a program uh, right now. He had a little bit of an altercation with uh, – was it Lesnar – uh, this past week on Raw, but I don't know if you can you can take too much from that. So I, I think we'll see Seth Rollins versus returning Randy Orton, but really, what the hell do I know? Sure, I would have thought that, you know you would give Daniel Bryan the win in the Royal Rumble, uh, you know, based on the fact that Roman Reigns hasn't been you know getting over with the crowd as much as they'd hoped. But yeah, I I'm, thought for sure, and I, I had somebody who you know talks to people at WWE said that one idea was for Daniel Bryan to win the Rumble and with the idea that Brock was leaving, they would have, you know, this little guy, Daniel Bryan, pin Lesnar clean on his way out and, you know, send the fans home happy and then write Lesnar out of the storyline that he got beat up by, you know, some little guy. Yeah, I would have preferred to see that. I mean, those, those guys would have killed each other in that match too. Uh, well, Daniel Bryan's probably going to try to kill himself in every match uh, f- for us. He's got to so, stop. Uh, he's got to stop the diving headbutts, man. I, that's that's got to be the worst move in wrestling. You know, you say that, but uh, having like performed a lot of these these techniques, some of these pro wrestling techniques, I don't, I don't think that's much worse than anything else. Um, I think it's just his style. You know, his overall style. He, he works at a very fast pace. He bumps really hard. Uh, and you know it takes a lot of a lot of toll on your body, especially as a smaller guy who doesn't have all the extra muscle and padding to take that damage. For sure. All right, Tom. Let's uh, we'll wrap this up before my computer goes out here. I'm taking off for Vegas tomorrow, and uh, I'm sure uh, one of those days we'll uh, we'll see each other and we'll uh, we'll have a few uh, coldies at the Gem of Las Vegas Hooters Casino, yeah. not the restaurant, the, the casino. Yeah, my favorite place in Las Vegas for any people who come from out of town, the Hooters Casino, always guaranteed to be a winner. doesn't matter if it's the cards at the table or the breasts behind them, but you're going to win out if you go to that Hooters Casino, guaranteed. All right, and with that, we'll, uh, we'll see you next week, guys. Thanks.